Let's go to the information treatments. So let me see. Let me be brave. Ugh. I want to click on this link. Okay, I'll click on it this way. Why does the mouse... Okay. I cannot make the mouse work. I feel very incompetent. Ah, wait. Wait, wait, wait. There's a little one here. Okay. Yes. This is very challenging. Try something else. Okay. No, no. I will. I will. Pas de nouveauté. Wait. Okay. Okay. Yes? No? Maybe. <laughs> okay, this is, this is. Oh la la. Okay, well, I'll show you the screenshots. That's why I have screenshots, but I like to show the video. It's a very cool video. Um, I was very disappointed not to see it nominated for the Academy Awards this year, but maybe next time. So the first information treatment is basically a video uh, that people see which will show them the actual number of immigrants in, in their country. Uh, and so the video goes through these images. So today, what share of the population in the United States are legal immigrants? So it will show them today, you know, legal immigrants make up 10% uh, of all people in the United States. We also have a version for total immigrants in case people th say, okay, but there's a lot of illegal immigrants. So another version says 13.5% are immigrants overall. And then for benchmarking, because I think this is useful, people may say, yeah, but my country still gets many more immigrants than everyone else. To benchmark it, we say, for comparison, among rich countries, the lowest share of legal immigrants is 6.1%, that's actually in Finland. And then the highest share of legal immigrants is 29.1%, that's in Switzerland. So for all the countries, they're really bracketed between these. Uh, they're well in the middle. And so one of the messages here is not just how many immigrants are there in my country, but also, you know, Am I normal relative to other countries? So that's, that's the message here. Okay. What about the origin of immigrants? Uh, I'm very sad not to see the video here because it's very cool. So today, you know, think about all the immigrants legally residing in the US today. There's this map of the world. And we ask, where do they come from? And then uh, we will highlight and color each region of the world with a number of little stick men that will be proportional to the true number of immigrants. Okay. So it's not like giving raw numbers. It's just showing... You can see visually where the immigrants come from. And then these little stick men go and get assigned to the bottom so that they remain there on the screen. So this was, for instance, Latin America. Then the little stick men form, for instance, from Asia. It goes in, in uh, descending order. Uh, and then at the end, once this is done through all the world, in the video, you have the screen showing the regions and the actual proportion of immigrants out of all immigrants coming from that region. So visually you can see, well, most of them come from Latin America, the next come from Asia, very, very few come from the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, even Canada, etc. Okay, so you can see this clearly, it stays on the screen for a while, you can, you can look at it, uh, etc. One fun fact here, initially, uh, to show you the perils of designing treatments. Initially we have this map of the world and we said, oh, let's take the little, you know, let's take the little stick man, and let's move them from all regions of the world to the United States so that the United States gets filled with little stick men. And then Alberto was like, oh, this looks like an invasion of the US. <laughs> and so this could have gone pretty wrong, I think. Um, so in the end, this is neutral. They're listed below. Okay. And then finally come the hard work treatment, which is really an anecdote. It's not factual whatsoever. It's really trying to, stri you know, to strike an emotional chord with people. So the anecdote treatment just shows you a day in the life of a very hardworking immigrant. So, you know, Emma legally came to the US at age 25. She lives with her husband, so she works super hard. She works two shifts. She gets up very early, goes to the first job in a retail store, then finishes work, goes to another job, takes public transportation, is very tired, goes home, helps her kids. And then after the kids, you know, are going to bed and are helpful with their homework, she stays up to take some online courses because there's nothing she wants more in life than to start her own small business. Okay, so that's very much like the entrepreneurial, hardworking immigrant. Um, it's a bit like what they call a Schrodinger's immigrant, right? They, they're lazy, but they will also steal your job. So this is, um, this is trying to appeal to that. Uh, okay. What happens on the, uh, on the perceptions of immigrants? Well, first of all, the treatments work in the sense that they move the first stage. So the first stage would be the corresponding misperception that they're supposed to move. 
they work in the sense that yes the share of immigrants information reduces that's the first column uh, in what's in red reduces the perceived share of immigrants in the countries but you know the gap was much bigger than five percentage points so people somehow don't as assimilate the full information or they don't believe it uh, or they say yes but there's other immigrants or yes but there's second generation immigrants whatever it is it doesn't close the full gap so uh, the misperception gets a bit close but not entirely um, it doesn't shift the other views it doesn't shift the share of respondents who are christian muslim poor etc the information on the origins um, tends to shift what it's supposed to shift which is the, the share of immigrants from the middle east gets reduced, the share of immigrants from Western Europe, North America gets increased, uh, share of Muslim respond immigrants perceived gets reduced, Christian gets improved, etc. And the hard work treatment shifts the view uh, that lack of effort, for instance, is the reason for immigrants to be poor, it reduces that view. So broadly, the first stage is there, but it's clearly not like people believe 100% or totally absorb that information uh, either. And so what happens on the policies? Well, on the policy, there's you know, really not no effect on any of the policies of this information, contrary to the very strong effect of just inverting the order of the treatments. So really no effect of the share uh, of immigrants. A slight effect of, on supporting immigrants. If you think there's less immigrants, if you're shown that there are less immigrants, you tend to support a bit more immigration uh, overall, but really no change in redistribution share origins of immigrants neither the hard work works a bit in the sense that it improves a bit the spending a little bit increased support for redistribution but if you interact with the order treatment which are the last uh, few lines just interacting each of this treatment with the order in which the information is shown really it swamps it completely there's really zero effect arising from any of them uh, you know in addition to the main effect of the order treatment which is very negative at the top okay so we can also look at heterogeneous effects. I'm just going to summarize them. If you cut by different groups, uh, you can cut by these groups, which showed very different misperceptions. It would be natural to cut to see the differential effects on these different groups. And what we can see is that if we cut left and right wing, college versus not college educated, low skill immigrants in immigration, uh, low skilled respondents in immigration intensive sectors versus others, male versus female, we can see that the groups which started with the most negative baseline views are also the ones which react more to the order of being primed to think about immigrants first, which makes sense. You know, they have the most negative views, they're made to think about immigrants, they reduce their support for distribution more. Um, okay, so to sum up here, uh, the views about immigrants are systematically quite wrong and negative. And yes, people are wrong about possibly many things. They're also accurate about many things. Uh, here, what's striking is the systematic nature of these misperceptions and just making people think about immigrants, perhaps because of these negative misperceptions that are brought out, generates a negative impact on redistribution. So you can think that natives' views can be manipulated strategically by anti-immigration parties, policies, of course, but they can also be manipulated by anti-redistribution parties. You know, just alluding to immigration can generate a bit of a backlash against redistribution. And so... Uh, even if you don't care about immigration per se, it could have this unintended effect uh, on redistribution. So I'm very curious to hear in your question, uh, and thank you so much for your attention. So, ask away. We still have like 25 minutes or 30 minutes, yeah. We have plenty of time. So let's take a first group of like four to five questions. Okay. Uh, hello, Stephanie. Thank you for that uh, excellent presentation. Uh, Christopher Hoy at Australian National University. I just had a, a quick question in regards to uh, the differences between countries and whether the effects in the US were stronger than uh, in Western Europe? Of the treatments, you mean? Yes, that's mm -hmm. I can actually respond uh, on the spot because um, I will, they may get mixed otherwise. So the treatment effects of the order 
are really heterogeneous by these type of respondent characteristics. So whoever starts with more negative views. But the U.S. doesn't systematically have more negative views about immigrants at all. Like, there was some... It really differs because the, the reality is different in the different countries and then the perceptions are different. So there was no strikingly different effect in the U.S. for that. Um, what is true, though, is that the heterogeneity, so to avoid showing 50 graphs, when I cut by respondent characteristics, I pulled all the countries. And one thing that you can see is that the polarization, for instance, between left and right is not the same in all countries. So, for instance, in Sweden, the gap between left and right is very small. Um, in the U.S., it's much larger. And then in France and Italy, it's kind of intermediate between these. Thank you for an excellent presentation. I wanted to ask you about um, children born to immigrant parents and uh, that effect seemed uh, very counterintuitive that they had larger share of misperceptions than those not born to immigrant yes. parents. Can you Absolutely. So that's, that, is, that is very interesting. So we did put that question in because it, it was interesting to see whether people who are born to immigrant parents, not themselves immigrants, have a different different view um, it was mostly for curiosity but it does show a different effect so if you look at it's here basically people who have no immigrant parent and people who have an immigrant parent people who have an immigrant parent think they're more immigrants yes absolutely I guess it's very salient around you you interact with immigrants perhaps uh, so yes you think they're more immigrants however very much like the contrast between left and right wing which for instance does not show on the share of immigrants but shows in the composition it also shows for these people in the opposite effect. So people who have immigrant parents are also more positive about immigrants. Um, so they're more accurate in the other, uh, you know, in the other ways, or they show no difference in the composition of immigrants. So for instance, here, people who have an immigrant parent are more accurate about the actual share of Christian immigrants, although they're also wrong. Um, they are also, you know, um, a bit, a bit more positive in general about the high educated immigrants, etc. They're definitely, if we go to the, yeah, look at the gap here. Does Mohammed get more transfers, pay less taxes? People who have an immigrant parent are much less likely to say that. Okay, so yes, they think they're more immigrants, perhaps because that's more salient to them, but they're also not as biased, if you want, against against immigrants. One thing which we should have asked is the origin of the parent. In fact, we may have asked it and not exploiting it to see whether. You know, having actually, for instance, a parent from one of these regions is different from another region. Yeah. yeah. Can I? <coughs> Quite interesting. But I want to understand that uh, even if they're immigrants, keeping them in one bracket, uh, it seems to be a little difficult. For example, h for how long they are immigrants? Are they in a recent years or they are being immigrant for a long period? That is an important question to look at. That is one. I think second one I would say, uh, even in native case, uh, are they the original natives or at some point of, let's say, 30 years back or 20 years back, they were also immigrants at some point of time. So that gives my perception differently. I was an immigrant, let's say, 30 years back or 20, very long. Then I became the mm. native. So my perception towards immigrants will be really different than a true native in that sense. Okay, so one thing to note is that the sample of respondents is only native. So it, we... we screen on people who are born in the US and France in Italy. So we don't have immigrants answering these questions. Um, the only thing we have is people whose parents are immigrants. And the definition of immigrant here is someone who's born in the country, uh, who's not born in the country, regardless of, you know, how long they've been there and whether they have citizenship already. It's just to standardize it across countries. So what you can see already is that just having an immigrant parent definitely shapes your views. Um, I'm sure that being an immigrant yourself shapes your views too. Uh, we don't have that because we have no respondents who are immigrants in the sample. Right. Thank you. Uh, Nora Lustig here. Thanks for a very illuminating talk. I have uh, one question is um, if you combine variables, for example, are people who have the perception that they're more immigrants than what they actually are tend to have also negative perceptions in terms of whether they're more mm. or less educated? Uh, I was surprised, you know, by two fi facts that you showed that the young think, tend to yes. think that they're more immigrants than the old and that women tend to think that they're more immigrants than uh, male. 
I would have thought the opposite. But then I started thinking, mm -hmm. well, but maybe it doesn't mean that they don't like immigrants less exactly. than the yeah. other ones. So mm -hmm. I think it'd be interesting to yes. combine. Yes, so that's why we show these by responding characteristics. So it's not at the individual level, if you want, but it's at the group level. And at the group level, you can see that um, that's why I tried to single out, if you want, the share of immigrants question, because you see, you know, people can, can think something about the share of immigrants, and then the composition that they perceive and how favorable they are goes in the opposite way. So, as I said several times, left and right wing perceive the same share of immigrants, the same overinflated share, but then they think very differently about who are those immigrants and how much do we like them. Uh, people who have an immigrant parent or not are also... Uh, you know, overestimate the share, but then are very positive about immigrants and are more accurate along other views. Women here tend to uh, overestimate the share. They also tend to be more negative in general. But for young people, you're right. Young people here, perhaps because they interact more with immigrants. In fact, there was this correlation which we took out because it's really, it seemed to have a causal implication, which was just that if you know an immigrant, you're more positive. You think they're more, but you're much more positively inclined and you're more accurate along the other views. So this sort of exposure effect could be that younger people just interact with many more immigrants, so they overinflate the number in their head due to saliency, but they're also more positive along the other dimensions. Absolutely. Um, so within respondent, you can do these regressions, and they look similar to these, like, you know, if you want across group or within group results too. Frank Cowell, London, <coughs> London School of Economics. Um, uh, in fact, your last remark about you know, if you know an immigrant and the consequences of that are very pertinent to the question I wanted to ask. Well, actually, I want to ask a very narrowly focused question. Um, as you may know, the UK has, in recent years, quite an interesting political history regarding attitude to immigrants and other things. And yet, one thing that fascinated me about your slides was how often the UK, in its responses, its biases, and so on, were very close to, for example, Germany. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I just find that very interesting, and I wondered if you had any observations on that, uh, but it, as I say, it's a somewhat narrowly focused question. No, I, I get it completely. In fact, you know, this, this was done, you know, the survey was done, uh, started end of 2017, uh, and then continued into 2018, so it's definitely the period you're alluding to for Britain, already Brexit well, you know, voted for and well underway. Uh, and yes, the UK does not look very different from you know, it looks very different from Sweden, it looks different from the US, but it doesn't look that dissimilar from France and Italy. Um, and so, I guess, one question is, why is there no Frexit? Is that the question? No, I mean, I, it, it is very interesting why it has a consequence, if, if that's truly what's driving this, why it has a consequence in the UK. One answer could be there are many other things driving it. Um, and the other answer could be that uh, not in all countries is this taken to, you know, that level of action. Um, so I think the more relevant ones for the UK would be, for instance, here, the share of highly educated immigrants. So here, the UK is really an outlier. Um, so the perceived share of highly educated immigrants, look at the second line for the UK, the red square is the misperception in the share of highly educated immigrants. People really underestimate the share of highly qualified educated immigrants by 25 percentage points in the UK they tend to slightly underestimate natives, high education too. The UK gets a lot of highly qualified, high-skilled immigrants, actually. Um, you know, the US also underestimates it. It gets a lot of very highly qualified immigrants. It still underestimates it a bit, but the UK is really an outlier here in terms of the, the, the wrong view. Sweden is pretty wrong too, yeah. I, no, as in the gap between the two absolutely is there everywhere, and I mentioned that, but just the, the kind of a raw underestimation on immigrants is very large in the UK. Yeah. In the other countries, it's more that people are over-optimistic about their own natives' high education. Uh, in the UK, people are very negative about the immigrants' high education. So, yeah. Oh, well, I actually, the microphone, I don't know. Um, Gordon Anderson, Toronto. Um, I'm interested in your use of the word native. We were a bit picky about that in Canada. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if you've got any data on those US citizens or natives who are Aboriginal, because their perception is everybody else is an immigrant. Um, 
Well, and it's a very different sort of scenario. The problem is it's a really small sample. Of absolutely, it's a very small sample. In fact, minorities overall are very. We don't oversample them here, so they tend to be, you know, very small numbers. Uh, in a new project we're doing in the US, we actually oversample minorities explicitly. It's not about immigrants; it's about the general attitudes towards the government and government help and redistribution. Uh, there we oversample them. Here we don't. But you know, I, I don't know. I don't know that that perception of indigenous Native Americans is there. I, I have not seen it documented, whether they truly think everyone else is an immigrant or not. So I cannot comment on that. The use of the word native is a bit by, um, a bit by constraint in the sense that I could say US born, French born, Italian born, UK born, and Swedish born, and German born every time. But I, since it's about all the countries, native literally means born in the country, strictly speaking. So that's why I'm using that word without the connotation of who's, you know, originally a Native American, for instance, absolutely. And that's obviously a very thorny and important issue, um, which we don't study here. Yes, uh, Alain Tranois, Marseille. Um, uh, about overestimation and, and location of the respondent, mm -hmm. uh, uh, do you have exactly the same magnitude of overestimation uh, for example, of New Yorkers, about the share of immigrants in New York, and for example, in Dakota, uh, mm -hmm. for exactly for the same, because yeah. it might be that people, for, for example, in Dakota, it, are thinking about the share of immigrants in New York when they answer, and, and, and they, they make uh, here a, a right. big mistake, right. why the, the New Yorker uh, didn't. Yeah, so we had a whole part on what you would call, what you could call, if you want, exposure effects. So we all, always only ask people about the national share of immigrants. We don't ask them in your region, etc. But we can correlate that perception with whatever is happening around you locally. In addition to putting in all your own characteristics, like income, political affiliation, education, etc., we can put in at the very local level, like in your commuting zone. We know there's a code, for instance, and we know very detailed geographic location in the UK, in the Europe too. You can say, are there more immigrants in your zone? Uh, around you, uh, how many minorities are there, what's the unemployment, etc. We can throw all of it in. And what we can see is that very much like knowing an immigrant makes you overestimate the share, but also makes you more favorable to immigrants. Um, having more, living in a more immigration intensive area makes you overestimate even more the share of immigrants. So people in Dakota, in that South Dakota in that sense, would be less overestimating the share of immigrants than someone living in New York, but they would also be more wrong about the other aspects of immigrants and more negative about immigrants than someone living in New York. So clearly there is a saliency effect of seeing a lot of uh, immigrants around, but it also makes you more favorable, yeah. Hello, Thisa Garner. Thisa Garner from the US. Um, I think about the political situation in the United States and I, I'm very well aware that a lot of the research that you're finding, the um, political right marketing, people have also found the same result and have used it in their marketing strategies for political mm -hmm. um, candidates. So I was wondering how you see your research contributing to the political discussion mm -hmm. and policy relevance. Yeah. Yeah. So one, one interpretation would be, oh, this is, you know, this is pretty terrible, giving that result that just talking about immigration reduces, for instance, support for, for redistribution. Um, my take on it is, well, here's the accurate information um, along all the characteristics. You know, hopefully there can be some information value in showing we're not accurate. Um, and by the way, I had, you know, I wouldn't have been right on many of these questions probably either uh, before knowing all those numbers in detail. Uh, hopefully not as off, but you know, um, it, these are not that easy to know things. Hopefully providing that information will help a little bit the debate. That is my humble hope. Um, I don't know if it will work, but yeah. Paul Hufe from the University of Munich. Um, I might have missed it in your talk, but you mentioned that you had a follow-up in the field. Um, yes. Uh, could you share a little bit more about that? Like, was it obfuscated? Um, how do the treatment effects actually hold up also in the long run? Oh, the, the, fol the follow-up survey from this, yes, absolutely. So um, the, 
the first stage effects, if you want, which were already not as strong from the information that we wanted, they're you know they're decaying a bit, but they're still they're still there. So people who got convinced they're less immigrants are still convinced. I should note it's one week later for each respondent. To more time becomes very tricky. A lot of other information happens at the same time. Too little time, you wouldn't be convinced either. Uh, so those are there, but they were not, you know, super strong. And then these informations did not have an effect on policy, so they still don't have an effect on policy. The one which had an effect was just to show the order treatment first. So that's very much weakened, which makes sense. It is a priming in the moment uh, treatment. So you can still detect a difference if you just ask policy questions, basically, for those people. But it's very, you know, it's quite weakened one week later. In a sense, it doesn't lend itself greatly to a follow-up because the information had no effect to start with, the factual information. Uh, the other one is a pure priming treatment, which works very well because it is a priming treatment. Yeah. Maybe one. Just, just a technical question. These right pains, are they... Uh, uh, taking out a country fixed effect, or have you just taken the average? Or? Uh, for the misperceptions per se, I don't like by, to see. Uh, listed by uh, by characteristic. Oh, um, yes, the fixed effect is taken out in the sense that we we you know we this is a misperception relative to uh, the country's immigration share. Yeah, so we're comparing across respondent groups, the misperception in that country, yeah. In all the regressions, I mean, I didn't show many regressions because they're not as nice for a talk, there's always country fixed effects for sure, yeah. Of the, of the, w which one? What fraction of the people is right in the Oh, politically left and right. Oh, so, oh, okay, this is classified. Sorry, the, the, the left and right classification, maybe it's worth uh, saying a little bit. Um, so we classified all the, we asked people about their party that they vote for. Uh, and we also asked them in the last presidential election who they vote for. So it's actually super correlated, except in the US. So a lot of people who are Republicans did not vote for Trump, and a lot of people, I mean, there, there's been some shifting around basically in, in the US, but you can, in most countries, it's quite consistent, the party and the candidate you vote for. So we classify people based on that, uh, kind of manually, by our own judgment, what, what's a, a far right, what's right, what's center, what's left, what's uh, far left in each country, and it differs. Um, I would like to know about uh, the, the illegal uh, share of immigrants, if that uh, if the gap is uh, greater or smaller. About the, you're, you're curious about the illegal share of immigrants in each country? Yeah, if you have an estimation, because this yes. is the legal, right? Yes, yes, we have. But what people actually see in the streets are yes. everybody. Yes, right? so in the US, it's by far the highest share of illegal immigrants. Uh, the estimates, so in fact, online, since we thought this was useful, we ended up providing all the stats for total immigrants, legal only, illegal. Uh, it was not a small amount of work because it's very hard to find information on illegal immigrants and you know take it with a take it with a pinch of salt. But in the U.S., it's 3.5 percent of the population. The estimate is illegal. So if you add up that number, it will be 13.5 percent total immigrants. Definitely not closing the gap. In the European countries, it's always less than one percent, and often much less than one percent illegal immigrants. So it would not move the gaps whatsoever. And, uh, and uh, I'm, as you said about uh, native, prob they're mo most probably white, right, in those countries, I mean, the people that are answering to... So we don't oversample minorities, so they would be pretty much what they are in the population, like uh, how you would randomly reach them, but, so... But maybe the answers would mirror the race structure in terms of what they are guessing as natives are the whites in the, in the distribution or not? So one thing which is which is true is that the share of minorities around you in the area shapes your views on immigrants. So you tend to probably confuse minorities with immigrants. Uh, so in fact, people in areas where there's a lot of minorities uh, over perceive less the share of immigrants. I guess they're not. They know that these are not immigrants. They know that these are minorities who live around them. Actually, yeah, Thomas. So but do you have, actually following up on this, so do you have the same uh, misperceptions when you ask to white in the US about black uh, ah. citizen regarding yes. uh, 
uh, for instance, re regarding education. And more generally, as you know, there's a long tradition uh, of research trying to explain the uh, small size of the welfare state in the US right. by the tradition of racial conflict. Yes, yes. And so with this kind of research, what can you say about this? Because you, at some mm. point you seem to say, well, you know, you have these negative attitudes about uh, migrants uh, everywhere. And, and you, so is there any way you can use the US uh, yes. evidence as compared yes. to other European evidence to address, you know, John Romer had this estimate uh, without yes. the racial conflict, the welfare Absolutely. state in the US would be 10 points of GDP larger. Uh, can you, is yes. it possible to return? I, I, I love this because last time, I mean, a few years ago, I presented a project on social mobility and Thomas said, what about immigrants? And so I did a project on immigrants. And and now Thomas says, what about race? Well, I'm doing a project on race in the US because you know immigrants is a distinct topic than especially in the US racial issues with you know between African Americans, whites uh, mostly, but also other minorities. So now we're doing a big survey, which is broader, which is just about how do these two groups think about the economy, the government, intervention, help, the fortunes of the other group, uh, the mobility, the opportunities for the other group. And what we can see, uh, without giving all the results, which I don't yet have, there's extremely large gaps in perception between whites and, and African Americans. So they view the world extremely differently, probably very justified so. Uh, they tend to be very wrong about what the other group is experiencing. Uh, economically, how much help they get, etc. And yes, there is this long-standing idea that whites in the U.S. don't want to redistribute because they think it's going to this, you know, stereotypical welfare queen that was mentioned in the Clinton administration. That theory is there. What we can see here is that the misperceptions are very much both ways. So each group is very, very inaccurate about the other group. Uh, and so there we also do this exercise of providing a lot of information about the other group. So I don't have all the results, but that's definitely the project we're doing. Because racial issues are very distinct from immigration, uh, definitely in the US, and I think in other countries too. Uh, hi, I'm Paul Segal from King's College London. Um, so I appreciate uh, Thomas asked you to, to do research on immigrants, but isn't the message now coming out that we on the left basically should try and say as little as possible about, about immigrants? Um, and if we want to kind of uh, increase support for redistribution, should we...